This week's Parsha podcast is sponsored by Leora and Jonathan Kohanoff from Los Angeles, California, in honor of their Shana Rishna, the first year of their marriage, and his Bar Mitzvah Parsha. May they merit health, success, Shalom Bayit, and to help spread the light of the amazing Foundation of Torch. And they also wanted to add, may Hashem bless you and the community to continue to grow and achieve great heights. And we thank them for their support and for their kind words. Parshas Mishpatim marks a stark change in the rhythm and the pace of the narrative. In the preceding 17 Parshas, we only had a grand total of 41 mitzvos. In Parshas Mishpatim, we're going to begin to get the laws of the Torah on Mas. In this single Parsha alone, we have 53 mitzvos. In fact, there's only three Parshios that have more mitzvos. And over the 118 verses of our Parsha, it's really going to be split up into three distinct parts. The first part, the majority of the Parsha, is dedicated to the myriads of mostly interpersonal laws, but also monetary, agricultural, ritualistic laws like the laws of kosher, laws about the festivals, and judicial laws, etc. The second part is dedicated to a prophecy and a pledge from God and guidance about the conquest of Canaan. Again, we're still under the impression that the conquest of Canaan is imminent. And the final part of the Parsha, beginning in chapter 24 is returning to the narrative of the Sinai experience. At the end of last week's Parsha, we had the Sinai experience, the revelation at Sinai. The whole nation experiences prophecy together with Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai. And that narrative is interrupted with all the laws of Mishpatim. And at the end of the Parsha, we go back and resume the narrative of Sinai. And one of the common themes of the Parsha is the importance of being careful with other people's money. You know, you have an account of Sinai, the most important event in the entire Torah, and sandwiched between the two accounts of Sinai is all these laws that mostly pertain to other people's money. And this fits in well with the theme that we find in the Torah about how severe the theft of other people's stuff is. In fact, it's one of the most severe sins. So, for example, the Midrash tells us that if someone has a satchel full of sins, the first one that they will be prosecuted for is the sin of theft. Going back to the book of Genesis, in the times of Noah, the Torah pointed out that despite the generation's varied and egregious sins, their punishment was set into effect specifically due to theft. And in addition, even in modern times, at the zenith of Yom Kippur, at Neila, at the end of the most sanctified and lofty spiritual day of the year, we pray to be forgiven from petty theft. And it's important to stress that in Judaism, stealing 10 cents from someone and stealing $10 million from someone really is the same sin. And it doesn't matter the amount that you're going to steal. If you're going to steal, you're transgressing one of these very important principles and laws in the Torah. And this extends beyond money. We're told in the halacha that you cannot steal someone else's sleep. Uh, Rabbi Israel Salanter, the great giant of the 18th century, was known to be particularly careful about not stealing anything from other people. So there's a famous story with him on Yom Kippur that there was, uh, of, of course, on Yom Kippur, it's the busiest day of the year. The synagogues are all full. And there was a lot of people in the room. And there was one guy who was sitting next to the door. And Rabbi Salanter walks over to him in the middle of the prayer on Yom Kippur and screams him, you're a thief. And the guy has no idea what he's doing. And he says to him again, you're a thief. And finally, after the prayer is over, he comes over to Rabbi Israel Salanter and says to him, what did I steal? I have no idea. And Rabbi Salanter points out, he says, there's a whole room full of people here. And the only place that we get some fresh air, some fresh breeze is from the door. And you're standing right by the door and you're blocking all the air from entering. You're stealing the air for the people. You're a thief. And finally, Rabbi Ezra Salanter was fond of saying that there is a tradition amongst the Jewish people that goes back from time immemorial that when the students start studying Talmud, they start from the second chapter of the book of Bab Metziah, the chapter of called Elam Metziah, which deals with the laws of finding lost objects. Why specifically do we begin our education in children in the laws of Talmud, specifically with the chapter that deals with finding someone else's lost object? And the answer is, it's to teach the child when you find money, you can't always just pocket it. You have to always be thinking about who really owns that, and you cannot take money that does not belong to you. And as a general rule, we tend to not be so careful about these things. 
And it's been suggested that perhaps to impress upon us the importance of these laws, the Torah inserted them in between the two accounts of Sinai in order for us to absorb their importance. So the parsha begins, Ve'ela mishpatim, and these are the laws that you shall place before them. Rashi asks the question, why are these interpersonal laws juxtaposed, the laws of the temple and the altar? At the end of last week's parsha, if you remember, we learned the laws of the altar, not to cut, not to cut its stone with metal, to make a ramp, not stairs. Why is there a juxtaposition between the laws of judicial practices and monetary interpersonal laws? Why is that next to the laws of the altar, says Rashi, to tell us that we have to put the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, has to be in the temple grounds. In Judaism, the interpersonal responsibilities that we have as a Jew and the religious duties that we have as a Jew have to go together. It's impossible to separate the two. The Jewish court of law is at the epicenter of the Jewish relationship with God. And the Parsha begins with laws in rapid fire in quick succession. The first law that we tackle is the law of a Jewish servant or a Jewish slave. What are the laws uh, governing him? So Rashi tells us that there's only two ways that a Jewish person could be, become a slave to another Jew, and that is either if they steal and don't have the money to pay, then the court would sell them, or if they voluntarily sold their services to raise funds. Now, in general, the idea of slavery and servants is something that in modern society we have a very hard time great trouble trying to study these passages uh, because it talks about slaves or servants. So what we're going to try to do is to make a little bit more sense out of this by first pointing out that there's two kinds of servants or slaves. One of them is a Jewish one and one of them is a non-Jewish one. Here it's talking specifically about a Jewish slave, and this is not someone who's actually a slave. It's more like a servant or a bondsman because they either voluntarily sold their services for a maximum of six years or because they stole and were unable to pay back and had to reimburse the victim of their crime. So the first law that we're told about him is that if he arrives by himself, he shall leave by himself, meaning that if he is unmarried, he is not allowed to get married during the years of his bondage. However, if he was married, then he would be allowed to get married a second time during the years of his bondage. And the idea behind that is, and this is one of the themes of this entire section, is that the Torah is very wary of people getting too comfortable being a servant of someone else. We're supposed to be servants of God, not servants of other people, and therefore it's a suboptimal situation for us to be servants of other people. We don't want people to get too comfortable. If someone is single in the regular world, he gets married as a servant, he may like it too much, he might want to remain a servant, and therefore if he comes single, he has to leave single, he's not allowed to get married in the interim. Uh, Just to point out something really interesting here, the way the Torah describes someone who is unmarried is bigapo, meaning that he comes with the edge of his clothing. This is a very interesting definition here. If you had to think of how you should classify someone who's a bachelor, someone who's unmarried, I don't imagine you would think to describe him as someone who comes with the edge of of their clothing. So maybe an explanation for that is that someone who's unmarried, their world their universe ends with the edge of their clothing. Everything that is beyond that is outside of them. It's a different universe. Their world ends where their shirt, where their garment ends. In fact, there is a custom in many communities during a wedding ceremony, during the chuppah ceremony, under under the canopy, that the bride and the groom wrap themselves up together in a garment. And the message is that previously he wore his garments, she wore her garments, they were different universes, and now they're going to be bonded under one identity. They're going to be fused together to become one. In addition, we're told here in verse 3 that the boss, the owner of the Jewish slave, is actually responsible to tend to the family of his servant. Uh, He's not only responsible for the well-being of the people in his household, he's also responsible for their family's well-being outside of his purview. In fact, the Talmud tells us that when someone acquires a servant— Really, they're acquiring a master because the laws governing how much the responsibility of the master extends to tending to the servants are so comprehensive. In fact, the Talmud tells us that suppose the owner has only one pillow and he has a servant, he has to give the pillow to the servant. He's got to feed his family. 
all these responsibilities are given to the master, he doesn't really acquire a servant, he acquires a master. In addition, the next law here is that he has to work for him for six years, and after six years he goes free, regardless of the reason why the Jewish bondsman becomes the servant of some uh, someone else. The maximum time that they can remain in servitude is for six years. What happens after six years that the guy says, I want to stay? I really like it here. I really enjoy my responsibility, my role as a, your servant. I want to stay here forever. The Torah tells us the master brings him to the court. They bring him to the door, to the doorpost. They bore a hole through his ear. He pierces his ear, and then they shall work for him forever uh, at a minimum until the Yovel, the 50-year Jubilee cycle. Why do we pierce his ear? Why at the doorpost? So Rashi tells us that the reason why he pierced the ear is because the ear heard at Sinai, don't steal, and he went and he stole, and therefore that ear that didn't absorb the message at Sinai should be pierced. What if the guy sold himself, he didn't steal? Well, then he voluntarily chose a new master. At Sinai, he heard that the Jewish people are servants of God, and he chose to become a servant of someone else, and therefore that ear that didn't absorb the message at Sinai That ear is pierced. Why by the doorpost? Why is that the location in which the ear is pierced? So again, Rashi tells us that the Almighty, so to speak, says that the door and the doorpost that were witnesses in Egypt when during the plague of the firstborn, God jumped over. He passed over the doors and the doorposts of the Jews and smote the Egyptians, those parts of the house that testify that the Jewish people are subject to God and not to other people, this guy is transgressing that because he wants to have a human master, therefore he is specifically pierced in the location that demonstrates that he should be subject to God, not to other people. I think there's a few interesting points to ponder here. Number one, Rashi tells us that when someone steals they transgress the laws of Sinai, and therefore their ear didn't absorb the message, and therefore the ear is pierced. But it is interesting that the ear gets pierced not when the person initially sins and initially is enslaved or is subject to the servitude of a master for six years, but only after the six years have concluded and he decides he wants to stay forever. Shouldn't the ear be pierced immediately? It's an interesting question to ponder. But I think more broadly, this Rashi is telling us something fascinating. What was the objective of the Exodus? Why did God take us out of Egypt? Why did God jump over our houses and only smite the Egyptians but took us out? It's so that we should become servants of God. And to the degree that we are servants of God, we cannot be subject to the will of other people. The Talmud tells us that that Torah really is about freedom. Because Torah is subjecting oneself to God, but simultaneously freeing oneself from any other master. If you're truly a servant of God, you cannot be a servant of other other people. And I think it's a good exercise, you know, to ask ourselves, are we really free? The answer is that if there's anything that we can't do without, to a certain degree, we're enslaved to that And to the degree that we are enslaved to that, we are not subject to God. And here we're told that the servant who wants to be subject to another person is transgressing the theme of being totally subject to the Almighty. So that's the first law of the Parsha. The next law is something that if you read it just simply, it sounds very odd. This is talking about a man who sells his daughter as a servant, and then the new master has the option of marrying her. So the way this actually works is that the father of a, of a minor has the rights to marry off his daughter if he so chooses. And this, of course, is something that people misunderstand and it sounds so terrible and why would the father do that? And the answer is those things are all correct. I want to point out the Talmud makes it clear that this is something that is only used in the most extreme cases. And the only person we trust to do that is a person that cares about the daughter more than anyone else, and that is, of course, the father. The Talmud, in fact, does tell us that it is prohibited for a father to marry off his daughter when she is a minor. It's prohibited. Yes, he has the right to do it, but it's prohibited. So why would he do it? The only reason why he would do it is if that was, let's say, the only way to save her. So, for example, the famous teaching 
in the Tosfos, the Book of Kedushin, page 41a, it tells us that during certain parts of our history, unmarried Jewish women were fair game for the lords, and they would take them and assault them and do all kinds of terrible things to them. And that was an instance where this law came in very handily, because the Jewish fathers who wanted to save their daughters from all kinds of terrible torment would actually marry off their daughters, would utilize this law to marry off their daughters and thus find a loophole to save them from the savagery of the people around them. And it's quite clear if you read this this particular case that this is not a case of someone selling off his daughter as a slave, as it could be interpreted. Rather, he's marrying off his daughter and the daughter is being married with the full rights and there's, there's, not, there's no difference between this marriage and any other marriage. But again, this is something that was only utilized in the most extreme of cases. The next matter covered by the Parsha is the laws of murder. And it begins, one who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. So this is where we get the bulk of the laws of murder. And there's a very interesting Rashi here at the beginning of this section, this 2112. He says that there's many verses here about this section, uh, about the laws of murder. And whatever it is possible for me to explain of why we have all the verses that we have, I will explain. This is just a very beautiful demonstration of Rashi's humility. Of course, there's no one who's a commentator's greatest Rashi. And he says, well, whatever I could do, whatever I can explain, I'll try to explain. And I think if you have the opportunity to go through the various Rashi commentaries on all these laws, it's a good way to get a flavor of the rigorous Talmudic back and forth where he's trying to understand the, the rationale for each one of the verses and why do we need this first, why do we need that first, and what does it mean, and how do we prove it, etc. It's a very good way to expose yourself, to dip your toe in those waters to get a flavor of what Talmudic dialogue is all about. So here we learn in this Parsha about the intentional and the accidental murder. And if this is, of course, something which is treated most severely, in fact, the Talmud tells us that murder is the worst sin, and it's one of the only few, it's one of the, and it's one of the only sins that repentance does not work to undo. Moreover, it's not just someone who willfully, intentionally murders someone. Accidental murder is also punishable, of course, not with the same severity, but it's also punishable because typically accidental murder is a product of carelessness. If someone does not want to disrupt their lives in a way that ensures that others are safe, then you know what? Here we read that if you murder someone accidentally, your life will be disrupted because you'll have to flee to a city of refuge. And there's an interesting Rashi here in verse 13. The verse reads, but for one who has not lain in ambush, meaning has not tried to intentionally murder someone, and God caused it to come to his hand. God made the guy kill accidentally. I shall provide you a place to which you shall flee. So why is God involved in the person's accidental murder? So Rashi tells us that what, what happened over here is that there were two people. One of them killed willfully and one of them killed accidentally. But there was no witnesses for either crime. So someone who kills willfully, that's a capital crime case. They need to be executed. Someone who kills accidentally, that's a case where they need to go to the city of refuge. They need to go into exile. But there was no witnesses. So this one was not killed. This one was not sent to exile. So what does the Almighty do? The Almighty makes these two people converge into one place. The person who killed willfully, who needs to be executed, was sitting underneath the ladder. And the person who killed accidentally was climbing the ladder. He's going to fall down. God's going to manipulate that. He's going to fall down, crash on the person who killed willfully, kill him. This time there will be witnesses, and then everyone is going to get the justice that they deserve. The person who deserved to be killed was killed, and the person that needs to go to exile because they killed accidentally is going to go to exile because now there are witnesses. This is an interesting idea that when accidents happen, sometimes those accidents are, in fact, God manipulating events to mete out judgment. So there's more laws here, just kind of run through them quickly. If someone is a murderer, they cannot take refuge in the temple. The temple won't save them. Someone who strikes his parents is going to be put to death. Someone who curses their parents is put to death. Someone who kidnaps someone else is put to death. If someone strikes someone else with a mortal blow, but the person is, we're not sure if are they alive or are they dead. So the few things. Number one, the person who makes that blow is incarcerated. In fact, this is the only case where someone gets incarcerated. 
incarceration is not a method of punishment. Rather, here, it's someone gets incarcerated because we're not sure what to do because the person is in the hospital. We don't know if they're going to die or not. We don't know if this is a case of murder or a case of striking someone else. If the person does not die or if the person gets healed and only dies subsequently, then the person who strikes him has to pay five things, has to pay damage, pain, healing, unemployment, and shame. But of course, he would not be executed because this is not a case of murder. Now, I want to point out that what we're covering here is just the absolute basic scratching the surface of these laws. There's literally libraries full of writings and the Talmud and the commentaries on each one of these laws. But of course, we're trying to cover the whole part so we'll go through it very quickly. The next law is the law of someone who strikes his slave. Now, it's important to stress that this is not talking about a Jewish slave. Here, we're talking about a non-Jewish slave. So I want to read this verse, verse 20. If a man shall strike his slave or his maidservant with a rod, and he shall die... Under his hand, he shall surely be avenged. This is really important, that the the law we're told here about a non-Jewish slave is that if, God forbid, the owner were to strike and kill his slave, he too will be avenged. And I want to talk a little bit about this idea of non-Jewish slaves. And I want to say, just as an introduction, I realize that this is a minefield, and it's one we need to kind of approach gingerly. But I want to offer three points to make the subject more palatable to modern sensibilities. So number one, the Torah does not endorse slavery. It doesn't tell us there's no mitzvah to buy or to own slaves. The Torah only legislates it. It only governs how we must treat them, number one. Number two, the nature of the legislation is all about the rights granted to the slave. Under what conditions he goes free, owner is not allowed to strike him. If, If the owner kills the slave, the owner is liable, all these laws governing how he has to be treated and the rights afforded to the slave. But I also think that some people might say that, you know, wouldn't it be better if the Torah just outlaws slavery entirely? Wouldn't that be ideal? So I want to kind of play this out as somewhat of a mental exercise. Who benefits if the Torah were to say that slavery is banned outright? Ostensibly, you would say, that the slaves would benefit. But is that really so? Suppose the slave is owned by a non-Jew. What rights, what benefits is he granted? None. He's chattel, he's property to be deployed at his owner's discretion. For him, the greatest gift in the world would be to be purchased by a Jew and to be treated like a human being. Thus, counterintuitively, if the Torah forbade the purchase of slaves, it would do nothing but harm to those unfortunate souls who happen to be enslaved by non-Jews. So I think kind of looking at this idea, this subject in historical terms, it does make it a little bit more easier for for us to understand how the Torah laws do not conflict with the morality or the sensibilities that we have uh, today. The next section here talks about what what is the penalty for bodily injury. So the first case is where there's two people fighting and they collide and accidentally strike a pregnant woman and causes her to miscarry. But there's no fatality to the mother, only to the baby. So the halacha is that because this was not intentional and because this did not actually strike a living human, only a fetus or an embryo or a child in utero, therefore it's only a monetary payment and there's no uh, punitive criminal um, payment uh, or punishment. I think this is another complicated subject that I I don't like really talking about, but we do see from here that an unborn child does not have the same status as a born child and therefore the accidental death is treated in somewhat of a monetary fashion. And here, of course, we read about the Famous verses, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand. Rashi points out and quotes the Talmud. The Talmud proves conclusively that this is not just uh, revenge. This is, in fact, a monetary payment. And more broadly speaking, in Jewish jurisprudence, punishment is not an act of revenge. It's a means of restitution, maybe even expiation. It's monetary. We do not gouge out eyes in a Jewish court of law. And here we read that if someone strikes their slave and they knock out a tooth or an eye, or Rashi points out from quoting from the Talmud, really any one uh, of their limbs or organs, then the slave goes free. And if he kills him, then he were to get executed as well. 
and then there's laws governing about how you have to guard your animal. And if your animal causes death, you are responsible to a certain degree. So if an ox gores a man or a woman, uh, or even a child, Rashi tells us from a different verse, you have to execute the animal, but the owner is not punished. What does that mean? So Rashi tells us this means that the owner cannot benefit from the animal at all. Alternatively, that he's not punished because unless the animal was a proven gorer, unless it habitually gored people, he does not need to necessarily worry that it's going to act in that way, and therefore he is not punished. However, the next verse continues that if the animal has gored multiple times, three times to be precise, and it gores again, then the owner is also guilty because he should have watched it, and therefore he has to pay a special penalty uh, because he did not guard his animal. We read about a case where someone either digs a pit in a public domain or uncovers a pit in a public domain, and people or animals fall into it. The person who revealed the public stumbling buck is guilty, And then we read a really interesting law about a man who steals an ox or a sheep or a goat and slaughters it and sells it. So normally when you steal something, you got to pay back double. But here, because you sell it or you slaughter it, you pay, if you stole an ox, you pay five times its value to the owner. And if you stole a sheep, you pay four times its value to the owner. Again, if you steal it and then you sell it or slaughter it. Why is there a discrepancy between the ox and the sheep? Why do you pay five times for the ox and four times for the sheep? So Rashi offers us two reasons for this discrepancy. The first reason is that when someone has to transport an ox, the ox walks on its own. Whereas when the thief had to transport the sheep, he had to carry it on his shoulders. And therefore, he was embarrassed in the transportation of his theft. And therefore, because he was embarrassed, that constitutes part of his punishment. It reduces their sentence, and therefore they only need to pay four times what they stole, not five times. Alternatively, Rashi gives us a second reason why the person who pay, who steals and slaughters or sells an ox pays five, whereas doing the same to a sheep only pays four, and that is because the ox is used by the owner in the field to plow, etc., therefore he caused more damage to the owner, and therefore he has to pay a greater penalty. And I think that this, this first reason in Rashi, it's a really powerful idea that the pain that someone experienced in the act of the crime itself is part of the punishment and thus reduces its sentence. And more broadly speaking, when people do sins, you know, there's two kinds of sins. You could do a sin and not feel bad at all, or you could feel bad and have some guilt and have some anguish when you do the sin. It's not done brazenly. Our sages tell us uh, along this line that the punishment for a sin it's not uniform across the board. Depends how the sin was done. If the sin was done and it caused, sort of speech, some pain, you know, the guy struggled with his Yetzirah, but he lost, in that instance, the punishment is not as severe because part of the punishment was experienced in the act of the crime, so to speak, itself. Chapter 22 begins with the laws of a thief who was burrowing in or tunneling in to someone else's house. And the person kills him, and he's not guilty. If you have someone coming to your house, they're coming to steal, it's not considered murder if you kill them. Why? Because Rashi tells us if someone comes to kill you, you kill them first. And this guy is coming to your house, and obviously he has very violent intentions because he knows he comes to your house, you're going to defend yourself, and therefore he's coming with the intention of acting violently to steal. And therefore, in order to prevent his violence, you're allowed to initiate violence to protect yourself. And this is an interesting thing. This Here we learn about the importance of self-defense. In fact, the commentaries add that this is not just with respect to murder. When someone's coming to murder you, you murder them first. Rather, any harm that someone comes to do, you're entitled to preempt them and harm them instead to save yourself from their nefarious intentions. We don't believe that we should go like sheep to the slaughter. We believe in self-defense, not in turning the other cheek. I, in fact, I tell my children, if someone hits you, hit them back. Hit him back twice as hard. Don't be a sitting duck. Defend yourself. That is indeed a Torah true approach. In the Talmud talks about the virtues of someone who's joyous worth suffering. That's for the righteous. That's not for small kids. That's for the tzaddikim. We must learn the importance and the value of not being bullied, of not being a victim, and of defending yourself. Just another interesting thing to point out over here is that if the thief, let's say, burrows into your house and you're entitled to kill him, they're actually not guilty for the things that they break 
in your house because the Torah, it's a general rule in, in, in Jewish jurisprudence that if someone does two crimes at the same time, they are, they are only punished for the more severe crime. So if someone does a crime that is liable for capital punishment and simultaneously does a crime that's only a monetary penalty – because the more severe punishment is so much more comprehensive, therefore the other law is not included, or maybe it is It is included, but it's not extracted in a Jewish court of law. So if the thief comes into your house and actually breaks one of your vessels, because at the time that they broke the vessels, you could have killed them, therefore you cannot extract that vessel in a monetary payment in a court of law. And then we read about the damage of animals eating my neighbor's food or if I make a fire and it goes to burn someone else's home and causes damage. I'm responsible for those things. Again, many, many details in the Talmud. We have to try to go through this quite, kind of quickly. We read about the four custodians. Custodian is someone who watches my stuff, but someone who watches my stuff could be in a, in a variety of ways. So the first law we read is that what's called a shomachinam, an unpaid custodian. I want to deposit something with a custodian. They watch it for me because they do it for free. They do me a service. Therefore, they're not liable for theft or if it gets lost, provided that there was no negligence, they're not responsible. How do we verify the veracity of his claim? I give my phone to someone. I say, just watch this for free. They agree. And they say, hey, someone came and stole it. Sorry. I, well, we don't know if they're telling the truth or not. So the halacha is, the law here we're told, is that the person has to swear in a Jewish court of law to verify their claim that it was indeed stolen or was lost and there was no negligence. And Rashi here tells us that there's another instance where someone needs to swear, someone who admits partial liability. I say someone owes me $100, they admit only to 50, they have to pay the 50 and the other 50, they have to swear. Whereas if they deny the entire thing, then they're not liable to swear and they're off the hook. So that's the first custodian, someone who's, a paid, someone who's an unpaid custodian. The next one is someone who's a paid custodian. And of course, because they're being paid for their services, their liability is greater. And they are liable if it is lost or if it's, it's stolen, but they're not liable to pay when it was a complete accident. So for example, I'm watching your sheep, you're paying me, but if a wolf comes or a lion comes or a bear or a snake comes, that's not something I could have prevented. Therefore, it was a complete accident and therefore I'm not liable for that. The next one, uh, the custodian is a borrower. Someone who borrows, they get all the benefit, and therefore they're liable for everything unless the owner was with them. And then finally, we have someone who's a renter, and like Rashi tells us, the laws of a renter are subject to disputes in the Talmud. The next law is someone who seduces a woman and uh, sleeps with her. Then the halacha is that she is granted certain rights, she gains certain options, he loses his options, he must marry her if she wants. She has that flexibility, but he does not have that flexibility. We also read about idolatry. The law that we read about over here is that regardless of how a an idol is designated to be worshipped, there's four methods of worship that apply universally to all idols. If someone sacrifices to the idol, someone bows down before it, someone offers incense or pours libations, these are methods of Worship that apply universally across the gamut of idols, and therefore it would be a capital offense to do any one of these four services to any of the idols. And then we read about not to oppress a stranger. Verse 20, you shall not taunt or, oppre- or oppress a stranger. This, doesn't, this means either someone who was a convert or someone who was a newcomer to this place. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Rashi tells us we have the exact same flaw. We know what it's like to be the outsider. We spent hundreds of years as foreigners in a foreign land, and therefore we should not point out the flaws that we ourselves have. What happens if someone does torment pe- people who are more vulnerable. So we read in verse 21, you shall not cause pain to any widow or orphan. If you dare cause him pain, then what's going to happen? Rashi tells us that this is a continuation. For if he shall cry out to me, I shall surely hear his outcry. My wrath shall blaze against you and I shall kill you by the sword and your wives will be widows and your children orphans. Very terrifying thing, very scary. If someone oppresses, if someone torments the orphan and the widow, then, they're, then they'll die and their children will be orphans and their wives will be widows. Rashi points out this is a double punishment. Of course, if someone dies, obviously their wives will be widows and their children will be orphans. So why is it to say both? They'll die and their wives will be widows and their children will be orphans. Rashi points out that it's a double punishment because they're going to die, but 
their wife and children won't know about it. And therefore, the woman will be a widow. She won't be even able to get remarried because there won't be any evidence of her husband's passing. Similarly, the orphans will not be able to get the inheritance because they can't prove that their father actually passed away. And therefore, beyond the fact that there will actually be orphans, there's an additional punishment that they won't be able to get the money that they deserve as an inheritance. Now, where does this apply? So Rashi tells us it applies to everyone. Everyone who torments other people gets treated this severely. Other commentaries say that, no, the punishment, the punishment that you're going to become, that, that, that your wife's going to become a widow and your children orphans applies only when someone torments widows and orphans. There was a story in the times of, of the Chavetz Chaim about a man who was renting a house to a widow and they didn't have enough money to pay. So he decided to torment them by removing the roof. And in the winter, the woman had to live in the street, uh, so to speak, because she did not have a roof over her house. And the Chavetz Chaim commented, this person will definitely be punished for this terrible torment of this widow and orphans. And he waited for many years to find out what's going to happen to him. And many years later, this person was bit by a rabid dog. And the Chavetz Chaim said, this is his punishment. We don't do these things to uh, anyone, and certainly not to the most vulnerable, the widows and the orphans. Next, we're told to give interest-free loans. When you lend money to my people, to the poor person who is with you, do, do not act towards them as a creditor. Don't take interest. It's prohibited for us to have interest in our loans to Jews. And the reason why is because you don't charge interest to your family. We're like one big family. And therefore, it's prohibited for us to charge interest to each other. Rashi tells us that our responsibilities our greatest to the people that are closest to us. So our family, and then our neighbors, and the people of our city, the people of our community, and finally, the all of humanity. But if we have an option to lend money to a Jew or to a non-Jew, we're, of course, required to give to the people who are closest to us, to our Jewish brethren. Now, it is interesting, Rashi points out, that the Hebrew word for interest is neshech, which, all, which also means a, like a bite, a bite of an animal. Rashi tells us that interest works a little bit like a serpent's bite. When the serpent bites you, you, all you have is a little wound and you think it's nothing, but of course it expands and the venom kind of increases and eventually it kills you because it takes over your whole body. So too, with interest, it seems like eh, it's only 10% or 20% or something like that, but of course it compounds and eventually becomes gargantuan. And there's some more laws here regarding Lending, if you take a collateral, it cannot be something which is of vital need for the borrower. So, for example, if you take, let's say, their blanket as collateral, you have to return to them every night. If you take their day garment, you have to return to them every day. You don't want to pay the people that you are lending money to because what's going to be, they'll cry out to God, and God promises, I shall listen, for I am compassionate. The Ramban points out that the word for compassion here is chanun. It means merciful or compassionate. And this comes from the same Hebraic root as chinam, which means free. And it tells us that this person will pray and God will listen because prayer, so to speak, is free. There's no preconditions for prayer to be efficacious. Prayer is an appeal to God's mercy and it could be answered even if the person is not worthy. So even though you're right, you lent the guy money in your magnanimity, but so what? If you cause them pain, God will listen to their pain and will punish you. We read about the prohibition against blasphemy, against cursing a judge. We also read about the proper order of the three agricultural tithes. It has to be sequenced as follows. Number one, you do the bikurim, which is the first fruits we bring to Jerusalem. Number two, it's the 2% teruma that you give to the Kohen. And number three, after those first two tithes have been separated, you give the 10% maiser to the levi, to the Levite. We read some laws about the laws of kosher. People of holiness shall you be to me. You should not eat flesh from an animal that was torn in the field. The only animal that we're allowed to eat is an animal that was slaughtered in a proper way. What happens if the animal gets torn in the field? What do you do with the shredded meat? To the dog shall you throw it. You're allowed to give it to the dog. Why specifically to the dog? Rashi tells us because the dog is being rewarded back in the... Exodus story, during the night of the Exodus, the dogs were quiet. And as a result of the dogs not barking amongst the community of the Jews, they get the reward that we throw them the extra meat that we cannot consume. 
We're moving right along here to chapter 23. Do not accept a false report and do not extend your hand with the wicked to be a untruthful witness. What does it mean to not accept a false report? Rashi tells us to either not accept Lashon Hara, which is evil talk, or alternatively, it's for a judge that a judge is not only here the arguments of one plaintiff without the other side present. And this is really interesting because the words of the verse is don't accept a false report. And we know that Lashon Hara is only when it's actually true information. And here we see something interesting. Something could be technically true, but could still be false because the intentions are evil, are wrong, are corrupt, and therefore the Torah can label it as false. Similarly, when a judge hears the argument of one plaintiff without the other person present, even if the words are true, still the process is corrupt and is considered false by the Torah. Uh, Interesting verse here in verse 2, do not be a follower of the majority for evil and do not respond to the grievance by yielding to the majority to pervert the law. So what does this mean? Rashi gives us several explanations. The first one comes from the sages in the Talmud. It teaches us three lessons. Number one, in capital crime cases, a majority of one is insufficient for a guilty verdict. A capital crime case has to have a judicial court of 23 justices. If you have 12 that say guilty and 11 that say innocent, that's not enough. It's, even though it's a majority for guilty, you have to have more than a majority of one. You have to have a majority of two. That's the second thing, where a majority of two with a guilty verdict can be rendered in capital crime cases. And thirdly, we're told that it is prohibited to contradict the head of the court, the chief justice, if you will. It's prohibited to contradict his opinion. And therefore, we start with the most junior of the justices, and the chief justice, so to speak, renders his opinion last because people cannot argue with him once he gives his opinion. And it's not necessarily that they technically can't, it's just they would feel very uncomfortable to do so. Another very interesting law here uh, about how judges should behave. Do not glorify a destitute person in his grievance. Suppose you have a rich person as one side of the plaintiff, and you're the judge, and you have on the other side, you have a poor person. You may think that you should show favoritism to the poor and to the vulnerable in judgment. And here we're told, do not do that. And I think there's a fundamental lesson here. What happens when someone tries to veer the judgment, the ruling in favor of the poor in lieu of the rich? What are they doing? What are they insinuating? In effect, they are insinuating that God cannot right this wrong. And therefore, it's your responsibility, so to speak, to corrupt the law to favor the poor. And here we're told that, no, it's, it's your job to follow the law and not to try to right, so to speak, what you think is something that God did that was wrong. The next law here, what happens if you are traveling and you happen to see that your enemy's ox either has a huge load that needs to be unloaded or has a load that needs to be loaded? Don't ignore it. If you see the donkey of someone you hate crouching under its burden, would you refrain from helping them? No, definitely not. You shall surely and repeatedly help them. Says the Talmud, even a hundred times, you have to continuously help them, even though they are your enemy, even though they may be wicked. Your responsibility, and the Talmud tells us, is to do what's right and to defeat your Yetzer Hara. Your Yetzer Hara, your evil inclination, does not want you to help your enemy, and therefore you help him specifically to undo that. Next law, do not pervert the judgment of the destitute person in his grievance. Distance yourself from false words and do not execute the innocent or the righteous, for I shall not exonerate the wicked. So a few laws here about how judges are supposed to behave. So the first in verse 6 we read here, Rashi tells us that these are two laws with respect to people found guilty and found innocent in a court of law in a capital crime case. After the ruling has been rendered, can it be undone with appeal? Interesting question. So here we're told that it depends. If the person was found guilty, we could still appeal and find acquittal. Whereas if the person was found innocent, it is prohibited for the court of law to undo that. Once they're found innocent, even if there may be a reason to appeal it to find a guilty verdict, you cannot do it because once the court found him innocent, once the court acquitted him, it can no longer try him for that alleged crime. And in verse 7, we're told to distance ourselves from falsehood. And the commentaries point out that even illicit sexuality in Leviticus chapter 18, it says, do not come close. Whereas with falsehood, it's told not just to not only come close, but it's told to distance ourselves from it. 
falsehood represents the antithesis of God. It has no redeeming qualities. There's no way that you should try to find a kosher, so to speak, outlet to falsehood. The Messiah of the past of the just, characterizes falsehood as the absolute antithesis of the will of God. And therefore, we're told not just to not get close to it, but to actively distance ourselves from it. And more laws with respect to judges, that they should not accept any bribes, for the bribe will blind those who see and corrupt the words of the just. You may think that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to create this Chinese wall, I'll be able to accept the bribe and still be impartial in my judgment. And here we're told specifically in the Torah that the bribery is going to disrupt your free will, even if you are indeed Someone who sees, even if you are indeed someone who is just, the bribery will corrupt you. It will cause you to be blind. Verse 9, we're told a second time not to oppress the stranger, for you know the feelings of a stranger when you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This is one of the themes that we're going to see again and again in the Torah, to not oppress, to not torment those that are less fortunate than us, especially those that are outsiders, are newcomers, are immigrants, are people who are more vulnerable, we have to remember that we too were once vulnerable, and therefore we have to have greater sensitivity and empathy to those people. We're told about the laws of Shemitah. For six years, we plow and plant and engage in agricultural pursuits, but in the seventh year, we take a year off. The land shall lie fallow. Similarly, Six days we work, seventh day we is a day of rest, it's a day of Shabbos, not only for us, but for our animals and the people in our household. Be careful, regard everything that I've said to you, the names of gods of others you shall not mention, nor shall your mouth cause it to be heard. We cannot cause other people to invoke the name of an idol. So for example, if you want to meet someone, don't say, hey, I'll meet you, we'll rendezvous by this idol. We also read about the three pilgrims. There's the festival of Matzos, the festival of Sukkot, and the festival of the harvest, which is, of course, Shavuos. We read about the pilgrimage. We have to go to Jerusalem, not to come empty-handed. There's a prohibition against slaughtering the Pesach offering the day before Pesach while harboring chametz. We read about the responsibility of Bikurim, which is the first fruits that we mentioned a little bit earlier, and the first of three times in the Torah where there's a prohibition not to cook a kid in its mother's milk, the prohibition against milk and meat. Why are there three separate prohibitions? Rashi tells us, one, to forbid the consumption of milk and meat, one, to forbid any benefit from milk and meat, and finally, one, to prevent the actual cooking, even if you don't benefit, and even if you don't consume it, it is prohibited to cook it. So that is the conclusion of all the laws of this section. And now we move on to section number two in 23 verse 20 about what God is promising to do for us to lead us in the land of Canaan. Behold, I send an angel before you to protect you on the way and to bring you to the place that I've made ready. Listen to his voice. Don't sin. If you listen to this voice and carry out what I have commanded you, I'm guaranteeing you that I'll be with you. I'll be the enemy of your enemies. I'll persecute your your persecutors. My angel will go before you and conquer the land. The land. Don't give in to their idols. Don't worship them. Do not act according to their practices. Rather, you should destroy their idols, smash their pillars, tear them apart. Worship only Hashem your God. He'll bless your bread and your waters, and I shall remove illness from your midst. This is a promise. You'll have an angel. He's going to help you conquer the land. But when you get there, you have to destroy their idols and not yield to their ways. They'll become terrified around, from you. They'll flee from you. God will send a swarm of, of hornets to attack them. They're going to spit their venom across the Jordan. If you listen, you'll have bounty. You'll have great blessing in your bread and your waters. You're not going to have any miscarriages. There shall be no woman who loses her young or who is infertile in your land. I shall fill the number of your days. Things are going to be fantastic. We're also told that the conquest will be slow and gradual. I shall not drive them away from you in a single year, lest the land become desolate and the wildlife of the field multiply against you. This is one of the counterintuitive things here we read in this parsha. The conquest is not going to happen instantly. Why? Because that's actually not a great blessing. Because what happens, the land is suddenly made empty and desolate. You can have an influx of wildlife and it's not going to be ideal. Therefore, the conquest is going to happen gradually. You're slowly going to supplant the people of the land, move in slowly, and it's going to be a better uh, settlement of the land. 
And in verse 31, a very interesting verse here, I shall set your border from the Sea of Reeds to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness until the river, for I shall deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hands and you shall drive them away from before you. In verse 31, we're given the biblical dimensions, the biblical borders of the land, south all the way to the Sea of Reeds in Egypt, north and east until the Euphrates, west until the Sea of the Philistines, which is the southern Mediterranean, And this is a repetition of the promise to Abraham. This is what's known as the greater Israel or the biblical land of Israel. It's interesting, much of what today is Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon is actually included in the biblical borders of the land of Israel. In fact, during David's time, his empire actually includes most of this land, and there is still today a small movement in Israel oriented around expanding the borders of Israel to include all of biblical, all of greater Israel. What should you do when you get there? What should you do once you enter the land and you have to deal with all the indigenous Canaanites there? You shall not seal a covenant with them or their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they cause you to sin against me, that you will worship their gods for it will be a trap for you. There's a big trap waiting for you. These people are idolaters. They're sinners. You get there, be very careful not to make a pact, a treaty, a covenant with them and their gods because it will cause you to follow their ways. The Ramban tells us that the prohibition against making a treaty with the local inhabitants of the land is only while they are connected to idolatry, whereas once they abandon idolatry, we can indeed make an accord with them because this only applies when they're connected to idolatry only. Don't make a treaty with them if that implicitly is a treaty with their gods. And finally, chapter 24 is going to go back to the Sinai experience back at the end of last week's Parsha. And it's important to stress that the first uh, 11 verses of chapter 24, there's an ongoing running debate between Rashi and Ramban when exactly this happens. Rashi here in verse 1 tells us that this section in the Torah is actually out of order chronologically. Really, it happened before the Ten Commandments on the fourth day of Nisan, so two days before the Sinai experience, it happened this chapter uh, 24, at least the beginning of chapter 24. But after verse 12, then it's after the Sinai experience, and that's when Moses ascended the mountain to get the Torah over the course of 40 days. So the Ramban, the Ibn Ezra, they argue, they say, no, it is chronological, so if you look at verse 7, there's a famous line that we say, that's not a seven ishma, we will do and we will listen. It's actually a dispute when that happened. According to Rashi, it happened before Sinai. According to Ramban, it happened after the Sinai experience. So let's read what happened over here. Moses, God said, go up to Hashem, you and Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, the 70 elders, prostrate yourself from a distance, and then Moses alone shall approach God. But the people do not come with him. So Moses goes and shares this information with the Jewish people. Moses came and told the people all the words of Hashem and all their ordinances, and the entire people responded with one voice, and they said, all the words that Hashem has spoken, we will do. Again, what did they accept? So according to Rashi, that this is all talking about before Sinai, he explains that this, that, that, that this is a reference to accepting the laws governing the Sinai experience, namely distancing, the, di, namely distancing themselves from the mountain. The Ramban, he says, well, no, this happened after the Sinai experience, and therefore the laws and the ordinances are the ones that we just read, all the laws that the people were instructed via Moses since Sinai. What happens in verse 4? So Moses wrote all the words of Hashem. What did Moses write? Rashi explains, again, this is all before Sinai. So Moses wrote the beginning of the Torah, from the beginning of the book of Genesis until halfway, till chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. That's what Moses wrote in verse 4. The Rabban says, no, it's referring to after Sinai, Moses wrote the mitzvahs that he was commanded. He arose early in the morning and built an altar. Again, the same dispute. When was the altar built before or after the Sinai experience? At the foot of the mountain, mountain and the 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent the the children of Israel, they brought sacrifices, they slaughtered bulls to Hashem as a peace offering. Moses splits the blood and places them in basins. Half of the blood he throws on the altar, and then the other half of the blood he's going to throw on the people. Verse 7, Moses takes the book of the covenant and reads it to the entire people, and the people respond, everything that Hashem has spoken, we will do and we will listen. Again, what book is he reading? It's a dispute, Rashi and the Ramban. 
He takes the other half of the blood and sprinkles it upon the people, and he tells them, Behold the blood of the covenant that Hashem sealed with you concerning these matters. This is an interesting symbolism here. The blood of these sacrifices, it's, it's, it's split into two. Half of it goes, so to speak, onto the altar for God, and the other half is sprinkled onto the people. And this is the binding, so to speak, of the people to God. This is the covenant where the both halves are going to get equal parts, half the blood to God, half the blood to the Jewish people. And that's going to create this bond, this covenant between these two sides. Similar to what we had in chapter 15 of the book of Genesis, the covenant between the parts, God tells Abram to cut the animals in half, so to speak, splitting of the two, half to this, half to that, is a way of binding these two halves, these two portions, these two sides of the agreement. So the commentaries tell us that the Sinai experience, at least according to Rashi, it was two parts. There was revelation, and then there was a covenant, and... Last week's parasha, we read of the Revelation, and this week's parasha, we're reading about the other half of Sinai, and that is the covenant. So Moses and Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, they ascend. They see the God of Israel, and under his feet, it looked like brickwork of sapphire, and it was like the essence of heaven in purity. So very, very difficult verse for us to understand, verse 10 here, that the, these people, Moses and the people that came with them, they saw God in a certain way. Of course, this is very hard for us to understand what this, exactly this means. But Rashi points out that the fact that it says brickwork, that's, there's a message that God is empathizing with us, that the Jewish people, they suffered with bricks, and therefore it became part of this anthropomorphical vision that they had, that it was brickwork, but it's, the lesson is that he's empathizing with us, that just like we suffer with bricks, he too, so to speak, suffered with bricks. Now, the fact that they looked, Rashi tells us, that they looked at God was inappropriate, and therefore the elders, the 70 elders, and Nadav and Avil, they are guilty of capital crime because they did a transgression by, by looking too close, so to speak. But because this is an ecstatic point in our history, this is a high point, God did not kill them until much later, and therefore we'll read uh, in the book of Leviticus about the death of Nadav and Avil, a little bit later on, and then in the book of Numbers about the death of the 70 elders. And here we read uh, that, uh, verse 11, against the great men of the children of Israel, he did not stretch out his hand. God did not punish them. They gazed at God, yet they ate and drank. They didn't have the sufficient reverence and awe for this experience, and therefore they were supposed to be punished, but God did not stretch their hand out, and at least not yet, did not punish them for that. Hashem said to Moses, ascend to me to the mountain and remain there and I shall give you the stone tablets and the teaching and the commandment that I have written to teach them. So it's a little bit of a question what this means. So first of all, Moses is told to ascend to God. He's going to be with God for 40 days, ascend to me. And what for? So the Ramban tells us that this is to get the Torah and the mitzvot. Rashi says that it's a little bit more of a narrow interpretation. It's to get the Ten Commandments. And then Rashi here tells us quite famously that the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, that it is is an encapsulation of all 613 mitzvot, they're all included in the Ten Commandments. The Sephorno, he has an interpretation that it kind of incorporates everything, that really the initial plan was to get directly from God the Ten Commandments, but just like the Ten Commandments, directly from God, the entire Torah, just like the Ten Commandments, we would have gotten on tablets, not just the Ten Commandments, but everything, all 613 mitzvahs, so to speak, if not for the golden calf. As a result of the golden calf, we have to get the mitzvahs not directly, so to speak, from God, but via the emissary, via Moses. So Moses goes up with Joshua, his servant. Moses ascends to heaven. Joshua goes as far as he could possibly go. He's going to wait at the foot of the mountain for Moses for the duration of the 40 days. And therefore, when Moses comes back down, Joshua is going to be waiting for them, and they're going to together go back to the camp and find the Jewish people in the sin of the golden calf. We'll read that in a few weeks in chapter 32 uh, onward in Exodus. Moses tells everyone, you wait for here, wait for us over here until we return. Aaron and Hur, that's Aaron and Moses' nephew, the son of Miriam, they're going to be the leaders. They're going to be the interim leaders. If you have a problem, you have a question, you go to them. Moses ascends the mountain, and the cloud covers the mountain. The glory of Hashem rested upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for a six-day period. Arashi offers two opinions when this actually happened. Was this six-day period before Sinai 
uh, it's before the revelation, before the Ten Commandments at Sinai or afterwards. On the seventh day, Moses was called up amidst the clouds. The appearance of the glory of Hashem was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop before the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses arrived in the midst of the cloud and ascended the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Rashi tells us that God made like a path through the smoke where Moses was able to ascend the mountain. And he's going to be there getting the bulk of the Torah from God for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Jewish people are going to be in the camp. And thus concludes our Parsha. Uh, Again, a very packed Parsha. I tried to cover it all, and of course, we weren't able to do that. Uh, We weren't able to go very deep into all the laws, but we tried to cover everything. Uh, Next week, Parsha's Teruma. Again, this is going to jump a little bit ahead. Uh, The chronology is a little bit hard to follow, but we'll try to make it as 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 understandable as possible. And uh, that's that. So the Jewish people, they got uh, many of the mitzvos, and we got another half of the Sinai narrative.